situation of the Muslims today and the reasons thereof and the solution. Basically, what we can learn from the golden era of Islam and in the end, concluding remarks. So as we know, before the advent of Islam, Arabs were in utter and complete darkness in terms of their moral values, ethical values, and in terms of their religious values and in terms of their literacy rates. Prophet was born in 569 and when he was 40 years of age in 609 was the time when the first Quranic ayah was revealed. Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years and was completed at the time of the death of Prophet in 632. So this expansion of Islam is shown from the time when Prophet migrated from Makkah to Medina, which marked the first Islamic calendar and after which Prophet started preaching Islam openly. So during this period of time, we covered the complete Arabian Peninsula, which was the maximum expansion of Islam happened during the 10-year period. During the Khulafai Rashidin, we expanded a little further and we completed the complete uh, Middle East uh, area. Again, maximum expansion happened during second Khulafai Rashidin, Hazrat Umar, who ruled from 634 to 644. During Umiyad regime, we expanded further and we touched the borders of India uh, on the east side and on the west side, we covered and up, up to areas of Africa and a part of Europe. During Abbasid Khilafat, we expanded a little further, so much so that at the peak of the Muslim Empire, Muslim Empire was a huge Muslim Empire stretched across three continents. So from the borders of India and Pakistan and Southeast Asia and China, across the Arabian Peninsula, the Middle East, the northern states of Africa, the southern states of Russia, the Roman Empire and parts of Europe such as France, Italy, Portugal, Turkey, England, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Britain, etc. When I was doing the research, I realized that although all of these countries were becoming parts of the Muslim empire, the population remained by and large non-Muslims. It was only during Umiyad and early Abbasid Khilafat that we saw a peak of and saw major conversions to Islam. So I dig a little further in terms of what was happening during Umiyad and early Abbasid Khilafat. So the first and foremost, they created a unified Islamic identity across the huge Muslim empire by replacing all the local languages with Arabic as the main administrative language of the Muslim empire. They moved the capital from Makkah to Syria, Damascus, which was more central to the Muslim empire. And they started minting Arabic coins and Arabic postage stamps. The system of Khilafat evolved during Khulafai Rajdin, but it became much more sophisticated during Umiyad and early Abbasid regime, whereby it was moved from a tribal controlled Khilafat to a monarch controlled Khilafat headed by Khalifa at the top and then divided into smaller administrative political units governed by governors and wazirs. The true concept of Madrasa emerged during Umayyad and early Abbasid regime, whereby headed by ulema, they were more responsible they were, they, their responsibilities were more judicial in nature, which means that their responsibilities was to implement laws, rules and regulations from Deen Islam across the Muslim empire through a system of punishment and reward as per the judicial system. In addition to being a judicial body, with the best of time, they started taking on additional responsibilities as an educational body, which means that they started imparting knowledge related to languages and legal system and judicial system and maths and science and history and geography. It was because of their role that we saw a much higher literacy rates among the Muslim empire, which was much, much higher than the corresponding empires at the time. They also introduced the first ever universal state funded healthcare system open for all Muslims and non-Muslims alike, whereby hospital and clinics could not return a single patient and they were working 24 hours a day. They were able to do all of these activities on the back of two major sources of fund. So first and foremost, 
was a very progressively growing economy on the back of their trading activities. So they were traders by nature. They used to trade in gold and silver and coins and silk and spices in diamonds and jewels. So they were wealthy in nature. In addition to that, they also introduced the first ever progressive taxation system of its kind, whereby they were taking the money, circulating the money taken from the richer segments of the society in order to help the vulnerable and the poor segments of the society. They identified the city of Baghdad as the new capital of the Muslim Empire because of its strategic location. So it was located between two major rivers which would help the irrigation in order for the food production so that they could food feed off a much larger population. The city of Baghdad was also very strategically located between two major continents of Asia and Europe which would help them tap the overland trade route in order to pursue their trading activities. So what they did was they created the city of Baghdad from ground level up from scratch in terms of planning and roads and infrastructure and houses and palaces and created the new uh, city of Baghdad as the new cosmopolitan capital of the Muslim empire while maintaining the overland trade routes in order to pursue their trading activities. The paper making skills was invented by Chinese, but they used to guard it like a secret. It was only when Muslims invaded China that they got the paper making skill from Chinese and translated it into much improved printing technology, resulting in huge paper mills. It was because of this that they launched the translation movement in pursuit of knowledge. So what they did was they gathered the books and the scholarly texts from all across the globe in terms of Greeks and philosophy and science and history and medicines in uh, philosophy, they gathered all of these books and they translated these books into Arabic and local language and started imparting knowledge to the population at large. Since they were doing all of these activities, they realized that they were in severe shortage of skilled human resources. So they created Batul Hikmah, the house of wisdom, as a place of learning and scholarship and actively recruited scientists and doctors and philosophers and engineers from all across the globe to come and study at Bethel Hikmah. Bethel Hikmah became a place of learning and scholarship where everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims, were learning from each other. It was even headed by a Christian at one point of time. So if we look at all of these activities, we realize that this is the gist, the spirit, the practical aspect of deen -e islam in its most practical form. This is the spirit of deen -e islam We also realize that deen -e islam is not just a religion for Muslims because whatever they were doing, they were doing for Muslims and non-Muslims alike, it's a religion for the mankind. It was because of this that they were able to create a model Muslim empire which led to huge conversions to Islam. It was because of this that we are led into an era known as the golden era of Islam. This is a huge research in itself. If I were to talk about all the Muslim inventions and discoveries, I would continue to talk for four hours. And even then, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do justice to the topic. So what I've done is I've picked out only a few of these Muslim inventions and discoveries in order to give you an idea as to what was happening during this period of time. So the golden era of Islam is normally believed to be from 8th century to 13th century because it was during this period of time that we saw a heightened level and the peak of Muslim inventions and discoveries. However, based on my research, I believe that the golden era of Islam actually started as early as 634. So the Quran revelation was completed in 632. Within the next couple of years, the Muslim mind was already started working so much so that we saw a first major invention, the invention of the first ever windmill in 634. Not only that, it was Muslims who gave the world the concept of using natural resources for the purpose of power generation and electricity production. So using wind through windmill to create power and electricity and using water through water dams to create power and electricity was a concept that was given to the world by Muslim scientists and engineers. 
The first world map, world map was given by a Muslim cartographer. The first and inoculation technique was not by Europe. 500 years before it was given in the Muslim world in Turkey, children were given cowpox vaccinations in order to fight off smallpox disease. The heart and soul of mathematics, algebra as well as algorithms, both have Arabic roots invented by one of the most genius of all time. Not only that, that they are the heart and soul of mathematics, they are the heart and soul of everything that we see around us today, be it in terms of complex or simple calculations such as calculator or laptops or computers or Google searches or traffic sig sig signal or any system or anything that you see around us today has one or both of these concepts as their root. Before the father of optics, people used to believe that our eye emits light. If it was father of optics who first described how our eye operates. Not only that, he was also the inventor of the first ever magnifying glass, which was built out of stones and the first ever camera, which was basically a pinhole camera. Progress in the aviation industry. The first plane may not be Wright Brothers. 500 years before, it was Abbas ibn Farnaz who not only invented the first ever parachute, which was built out of silk and feathers, but also at the age of 70 years, he managed to remain afloat in the air for good 10-15 minutes based on the machine that he has built. Baghdad airport was named after him. Arab coins used to honor him. There's a crater on moon named after him. Father of robotics invented crankshaft, which is the heart and soul of automobile engines. So every development and progress and advancement that you see around us today in the field of automobiles and cars and vehicles and robotics, we have him to thank for. He has also written the book of knowledge of ingenious mechanical devices, documenting all his inventions and discoveries related to machines and spare parts. There is a reason why we call him father of robotics. In astronomy, before Muslim astronomers, people used to believe that Earth is a flat surface. It was Muslim astronomers who first discovered that Earth is actually a sphere. Many of the Muslim astronomical tools and devices invented by Muslim astronomers and scientists are at the heart and soul of modern astronomical devices and tools in use today. It was because of these tools that a Ibn Hazm, along with his team of Muslim astronomers, were accurately able to predict Earth circumference in those times where they were off by only 200 kilometers. Ibn al-Tufail and Ibn al-Nafis are the pioneers of philosophical novel. Ibn al-Nafis wrote the first ever science fiction novel based on knowledge of the science known at the time. Ibn Sina, an expert in medicine as well as philosophy, wrote more than 450 books. His book, Canon of Medicine, documents all the diagnosis as well as treatment for practically all the known diseases at the time invented and discovered by Ibn Nesina. His book of healing was basically a book of healing for the soul, a very, very influential philosophical book in, uh, used by the West up until 18th and 19th century. He established school of philosophy and he was an open critique of Greek philosophers such as Aristotle. Founder of modern chemistry gave us all the basic chemical procedures such as oxidization, crystallization, purification, etc. It was Muslim chemist who perfected the use of soap for hygiene purposes and invented chemical bombs. Anesthesia, which is used for all the surgical procedures, was invented by Muslim chemists and scientists. Father of Surgery wrote Encyclopedia of Surgery, which was a 1500 illustrated book of surgical instruments and surgical procedures. Many of the surgical instruments invented by him mentioned in the book are still in use today. Similarly, many of the surgical procedures invented by him mentioned in the book are still in use today. An example is the cataract eye treatment, a very sophisticated eye surgery. He has also given us the uses for catgut, which is used for internal stitches purposes, as well as for encapsulating medicines. 
Ibn Nafis explained anatomy of body, breathing, cardiovascular system and circulation of blood. So if we look at all of these which and realize that this is just the tip of the iceberg and if we look all around us today all the invest in uh, advancement and the and the uh, progress that the mankind has ever achieved in the field of computers and mobile devices and cameras and electricity and power generation and google and internet and uh, uh, and uh, robotics and machines and vehicles and automobiles and avionics in plane in philosophy in surgery in chemistry in biosciences every aspect of our life we would realize that none of this progress and advancement would ever have been possible had this era not been there so this era was the foundation the of all the advancement that the mankind has ever achieved this era which is known uh, as the golden era of Islam coincided with the dark ages of Europe is not just the golden era of Islam. It's the golden era of the mankind. Never ever before nor after man has ever reached this height. So what has led mankind to the height that the mankind has never ever re reached before? These are the first verses that were revealed on our beloved prophet and I would want us to think about these verses as these are revealed on a nation which was completely illiterate. Even our prophet could not read and write at the time and God is addressing that nation and addressing that prophet and telling them that I am your creator. You are my best creation. Read. And in the very second verse, God is using the help of the science to address an illiterate nation, telling them that I am the one who has created you from a single blood clot. The basis of these subsequent verses is from the time when God decided to make Adam his Khalifa, his representative on earth. He taught Adam few names and when Adam recited those names was the time when angels bowed down to Adam. So these verses show that it is this knowledge that has come to us from God Almighty. It is this knowledge on the basis of which angels have bowed down to Adam. It is this knowledge that strengthen us, that uh, 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 confirm our our faith our connection with God Almighty it is thus this knowledge that relates us with God Almighty and it is because of this that um, the Muslims of the golden era of Islam used to consider pursuit of knowledge as a holy activity because of these ayahs and in this ayah God has also told us that man it is in the fitrat of a man that we tend to digress we tend to cross the boundaries this is just one ayah but there are numerous ayah in quran that gives us a very important message that the foundation of deen islam rests on two important fundamental one is iman and we all know what iman is another is ayat and i would like to define ayat a bit more ayat means any sign that if you think and ponder on that sign you're able to uncover the hidden truth hidden behind that sign i'll give you an example you you're going somewhere in the distance you see some smoke coming from behind a building now you cannot see see the hidden truth which is the burning of the fire at the bottom of that smoke but by looking at that smoke by thinking and reflecting on that smoke you're able to realize the existence of the hidden truth ayat also means to pause to stop to think and to ponder in fact the definition of ayat gets completed only when we think and we ponder and we utilize all our faculties the smoke will remain as smoke it will become ayat only when we utilize our faculties of sight and smell and we utilize our faculties of thinking and pondering. In Quran, there are two types of ayat mentioned times and times again. One is the words of Quran itself, the words of God Almighty, that if we think and ponder on these ayat, we are able to realize the existence of the hidden truth, which is the greatness and the wisdom of our of God Almighty hidden behind these words. The other type of ayat mentioned times and times again in Quran is the non-Quranic ayat, the work of God, the many creations of God Almighty scattered all around us in times and universe and science that if we think and ponder and utilize all our faculties on these ayat, we are able to realize the existence of the wisdom and the greatness of the creator hidden behind all these creations. 
and that was exactly what the muslims of the golden era were doing they were thinking they were pondering they were utilizing all their faculties in order to think and ponder on both of these ayat in this ayat god says that quran is rahim for those who believe so i would like to define the word rahim wherever the word rahim has been used it's translated as the word mercy which is a gross injustice to the word rahim rahim has been derived from the word rahima which is a mother's womb during pregnancy so it has all the meanings which rahima is for a child which is in four broad categories of definition first it's a lifeline it's a source of survival the child breathe from the rahima the child takes all its source of survival and nourishment from the rahima second it's a protection it's a shield it protects the child from anything that can harm the child third it's a source of selfless love and sacrifice for the child it is said that whatever the sense of selfless love and sacrifice that a mother has for a child is multiplied many many times in case of rahma so much so that in order to take care of the child's requirement it extracts the required nutrition from the mother's own blood bones and body without even letting the mother know it is the selfless love and sacrifice to that extent and fourth it's a source of long term nourishment growth and progress and development to an unprecedented unparalleled miracle like fashion so much so that a child is created from a single cell to a complete being and it was this rahim this miracle like growth and progress and source of this miracle like growth and progress this quran that took the mankind from that utter and complete darkness and took it to the height that the mankind has never ever reached before We also know that the foundation of the Muslim empire was based on the foundation of Deen Islam and I would like to define the word deen from Quran if we look at Quran Quran defines the word deen in three broad categories of definition for instance in this particular ayat Quran has defined the word deen in the meaning of the laws so the first category of definition is in the meaning of laws rules regulations set of guidelines and instructions that defines the parameter of our restrictions and our freedom second as in the meaning of malike yaumid din which means judgment which means rewards punishment payback decision it also means fitrat so fitrat is those set of characteristics that have been inbuilt in us by our creator which are in the most pure form so the goat it is in the fitrat of the goat to eat grass it won't ever eat meat similarly the lion will always eat meat it won't ever eat grass god has embedded the instinct and the knowledge to survive in an animal so much so that when an animal child is born it knows exactly what it needs to do in order to survive whereas in case of us as humans god has not given us the knowledge to survive god has given us the learning ability so when a human child is born it's completely vulnerable it does not know anything but the learning ability the learning frequency is profound it's magnificent this is our fitrat so if we define the word deen by combining these three categories of definition from quran deen is defined by quran as those set of laws rules regulations set of instructions and guidelines provided to us by our creator the god almighty which defines the boundary of our freedom and our restriction these are god given rules and regulations which are in accordance with our fitrat and whose basic aim is to bring out the very best in us by utilizing all our faculties to their maximum these laws god given laws pertain to each and every aspect of our life these are a complete code of conduct given to us and perfected by god almighty on the basis of which rewards and punishments are accorded in this world and the next and it's because of this that god says in quran that i have perfected for you on you and chosen for you islam as deen so god has perfected this deen and this deen has been given to us as nemat again if we look at quran quran defines the word nemat in multiple form it's been defined by quran as a shield a safety a protection from lawlessness and destruction and pain and suffering it means 
peace not just peace of mind but peace in each and every aspect of your life it means success and prosperity not just success and prosperity related to wealth but success and prosperity related to each and every aspect of your life for your spiritual success personal professional psychological physical physiological personal professional for economy for family for religious for the whole umma it's success and prosperity related to each and every aspect of your life in old medieval arab when people used to place something on the top of a mountain or a hill or a tree so that others could take guidance by looking at that thing that thing used to be called nemat as in the meaning of nemat khana which means height which means benchmark which means role model but the most important definition of the word nemat by quran is in the meaning of the unity of nation in terms of common set of values and principles and common set of purpose it is unity of nation and this particular definition has so beautifully described in this particular ayat while at the same time god is giving us two aspect of our fitrat one is that we tend to cross the boundary and other is that we tend to be jealous or envious of each other this is a part of our fitrat so god is saying that in matters of deen there is no possibility of any difference of opinion so if you are having difference of opinion in matters of deen there could only be two possibility either you do not have the knowledge you do not know what deen is and therefore you are having difference of opinion in matters of deen or you have the knowledge you know what deen is but in spite of that you are having difference of opinion in matters of deen because of your fitrat of being jealous with each other of being envious with each other and in that jealousy you tend to cross the boundaries and you end up having difference of opinion in matters of deen as well so deen is unity there is no possibility of any difference of opinion in matters of deen and if we look at the muslims of the golden era of islam we would realize that they had the nemat in all its meaning they were peaceful they were prevented and and shielded from lawlessness and destruction and pain and suffering they were the rulers of the world they were the powerful they were rich they were uh, they were success and uh, successful and prosperous in each and every aspect of their life they were at the height in terms of the role model people converted to islam during that era because of them being the role model because of their benchmarks they were the rulers of the world they were at that height but the most important of all they were the largest empire to have ever known stretched across three continents the huge empire but united as one single empire because deen is nemat let's discuss the decline of the muslim empire in order to understand the decline of the muslim empire we need to realize that the rise and fall of nation is not a matter of one year two year we are talking about centuries we are talking about hundred and hundreds of years many people believe that the end of the golden age of islam happened at the time of the uh, fall of the abbasid era uh, so uh, moguls of uh, uh, genghis khan created a very powerful dynasty in 1200 by the name of moguls of central asia and in 1258 when halaku khan who was a part of moguls of central asia when he invaded baghdad he marked an end to the abbasid khilafat and he destroyed the baitul hikma many people believe that it was at this point of time that marked the end of the golden age of islam many people also believe that the end of the golden age of islam happened somewhere between 15 to 16th century because after 15 to 16th century we do not see any further muslim invention or discovery however based on my research i believe that the end of the golden age of islam happened at the time of the death of al mamun who died in 833 so al mamun was the seventh abbasid khalifa he died in 833 as we all know quran revelation was completed in 632 so during these 200 year period muslims were governed by an ideology known as the thinkers ideology so much so that at the time of al mamun it was a punishable offense to do anything or say anything against the thinkers ideology So when Al Mamun died, the thinkers' ideology took a back seat, and the new emerging ideology was a followers' ideology. It's a huge debate between the two ideology. I cannot go into the depth of each. I'll just I'll uh, uh, address two aspects. One is 
free will and the other is pursuit of knowledge so as per the followers ideology on free will they believe on qadar that our fate is predetermined it's been fixed whatever happens happens as per that fate or as per the will of god almighty there is nothing in our hands this is a followers mindset as per the thinkers mindset they believe in jabr that whatever whatever is our action our fate is dependent on that whatever goes around comes around if something bad has happened it is not because of the will of god almighty it is because of the actions of man on pursuit of knowledge followers believe in nakal in andhi taklid in blind faith which means that do not ask questions simply follow whereas thinkers ideology believe in akal in reasoning in pursuit of knowledge as a holy activity basically it's the knowledge that connects us to god almighty and therefore we need to utilize all our faculties including our reasoning and thinking in order to pursue knowledge this is a thinkers ideology So when Al Mamun died in 833 the thinkers ideology took a back seat and the new emerging ideology was that we obey we do not question we accept what we are told in blind faith we follow our religion through nakal and not akal now since the followers ideology is the new emerging ideology the thinkers ideology took a back seat we all know that since ayat is the foundation of deen thinkers ideology is the foundation of deen and when we let go of the thinkers ideology we are actually letting go of deen islam so the gradual decline of muslims begin love pursuit of knowledge which was a holy activity as per the muslims of golden era that started to decline it started to close mind muslim mind to rational thinking because we are not using our reasoning and pondering we are using aql a uh, nakal which is blind faith andhi taklid since we unites and as per our fitrat we tend to be jealous of each other we tend to be divided into sects and groups because we were going away from deen and since deen gives you all the foundations all the boundaries of your restrictions and your on your and your freedom when we started to move away from deen it is in our fitrat to cross the boundaries and that started to led to our moral and ethical decline as well so much so that if we look at the time when the siege of baghdad happened and if we look at both sides of muslims we would not even believe that they were muslims so the muslims of the abbasid khilafat they were the rulers of the world they were the emperors of the world they were powerful they were rich but in terms of their situation gross abuse of their power and money and resources they were womanizers they were addicted they were alcoholics on the other hand the muslims of the mongols of central asia they were attacking their own muslims brothers but their feelings of jealousy and animosity were so profound that they were brutal in their attack they slaughtered each and every one in the abbasid kingdom and not only that for the battle hikma they threw all the books in the river they burned down the battle hikma and there were scholars who were studying there at the time they slaughtered those scholars and they threw their bodies into the river as well it is said that the water of the two rivers adjacent to the city of baghdad turned black by the ink of these books and turned red by the blood of these scholars it took us 300 more years to completely shut down our brain because after 16th century we do not see any further muslim inventions or discoveries 300 years later we were attacked by colonization because by that time we had grown weak in terms of shutting down of our rational thinking not utilizing our faculties in terms of jealousy and animosity between each other in terms of division into sects and groups we and fighting amongst each other that we were attacked by colonization again colonization is a huge uh, research in itself i cannot discuss the whole aspect i'll just highlight one major impact on muslims so colonization was a very scientific very disciplined brutal suppression at multiple level it was a physical suppression through physical imprisonment physical torture lathi charge through 
physical abuse of all forms it was a uh, ideological suppression through culture and language and inculcating of male dominated patriarchal mindset it was an economical uh, suppression by stealing of our wealth and our resources we were powerful we were rich we had gold silver coins diamonds jewels all of that wealth was stolen and was used to fuel the industrial revolution of the west so it was a multiple level suppression before colonization we had been rulers of the world for over a thousand years over 10 centuries we had a rulers mindset colonization happened for just one century for 100 years but because of this multiple suppression at multiple level we got our mindsets got enslaved to our colonized powers so muslims of uh, indian subcontinent were colonized by britishers um, countries like egypt and algeria were colonized by french spanish muslims were colonized by spain central asian states were colonized by russia and so on and so forth so because of these colonization a muslim mind got enslaved to the colonized powers the slavery from which we have not been able to get out from up until to date in terms of the current state of muslims we are 1.8 billion muslims worldwide 1800 million muslims worldwide over 50 muslim majority countries but in terms of our situation economically financially morally ethically we are far worse than our non muslims counterparts there is no innovation significant innovations and discoveries by muslims if we compare if we look at the nobel prize winners as a benchmark of these innovations and discoveries and compare us with jews for instance who are only few million in numbers we would realize that they receive over 22% of the nobel prize winners where we on the other hand Uh, are uh, approximately over 22% of the world population we have received less than 1% of these nobel prizes 12 nobel prizes so far of which nine are in the peace category there is no creativity there is no originality there is no pursuit of knowledge by muslims quite on the contrary islamic terrorist organization whenever they occupy the land the first thing that they do they destroy the schools and the colleges creating an impression as if islam hates knowledge we also witness the islamophobia and the growing momentum of islamophobia in this regard i would like to discuss few events of last year the first of this event happened on 15th march new zealand shooting we all know about that the terrorist he took out the revenge against the islamic terrorist organization by equating its members with those innocent muslims offering juma prayers at during their juma he killed over 50 uh, over 50 casualties um, and not only that he created a, a online live video which was streamed online and was watched by over 8 billion people before it was turned down and in that video he make it look like fun and entertaining to kill muslims so events like Like these are likely to increase in both frequency as well as intensity another event happened less than 10 days after the new zealand shooting on 24th of march mali fulani uh, village uh, was attacked it was a muslim uh, village in the african country of mali terrorists dressed like hunters shot down each and every member of this village and then the whole village was burned down the reason why we haven't heard that much of a media attention the likes of which we have seen in case of new zealand shooting was because the government of mali was behind this attack so the government has created a group by the name of self defense group and this group believed that this fulani village was used by islamic terrorist organization for its recruitment purposes they were hiring people and children from this village so the self defense group wiped out the whole village killing killing each and every one elder women children each and every member of that village was killed 
My concern in addition to the events like these is also in terms of the response by Muslim and the Muslim leaders worldwide, which is of two categories. The first category is completely distancing yourself to the events like this, thinking and saying that these events are happening to someone else. These do not impact me and I'm not going to be affected by this. The second category is of those Muslim and Muslim leaders who think that they are very vulnerable. They're very afraid that the events like these might happen to us, but they're not willing to do anything about this. They're, they do not have the courage to do anything about this. Even our Muslim leaders have approached the government to help protect our mosque uh, after the New Zealand shooting. We are 1.8 billion Muslims in number. We do not have the strength and the courage and the willingness to protect our own mosque. Another event that I would like to discuss happened on April 21. In this time, it, uh, the Sri Lankan bombing, uh, Christians were attacked during the Easter Sundays uh, in churches. And I was reading this news and I was thinking to myself that what has gone wrong with humanity that you would go below the level of humanity to target innocent people who are worshipping at their day uh, at their place of worship on their holy day be it muslims who were praying in in mosque on juma or christians who were praying in um, in churches on easter sundays um, the news developed further for sri lankan bombing and it was identified that the mastermind behind uh, the sri lankan bombings what was a father and two sons, um, a very, very religious, established, wealthy uh, family of Sri Lanka. And these, this, uh, the father and two sons were also uh, among the suicide bombers who killed themselves, uh, killing 265 people um, uh, in the process. So when Saudi, of, uh, when Sri Lankan officials raided the house, it was occupied by one of the wife, uh, by wife of one of the brothers, uh, Fatma, who was there along with her three young children and she was also pregnant at the time. So instead of being occupied by the security officials, she detonated herself, killing not only the security officials, but also her three young children and the baby in her womb. I was reading this news and I was thinking to myself that what type of mother could do this? Because as mother, it is in our fitrat to to protect our children, even if that means killing our own self in order to protect them through our whole life. What sort of mother could do this? What sort of religion was she following that can compel her to do this? And in spite of these events, if we look all around us in the Muslim world, what do we see? We see the, the, the religion being practiced only on the form, on the surface, in terms of language and rituals and qualifications only. We see in the Muslim world, pain and suffering and lawlessness and destruction and death and disease. We see Muslim majority countries either at war with each other or at war with themselves, a civil war. And I, the more I think about it, the more I, I, I ask myself that is this Deen Islam, the Deen Islam that God has promised as, uh, as Namat. And the more I realize this, the more it seems that this is, this cannot be Deen Islam because Deen is promised as Namat by God. This is one or the other form of Mazahib Islam or Mazhab Islam. This is not Deen because Deen unites, Mazhab divides. Deen pertains to each and every aspect of your life where Mazhab is restricted to religious expressions only. Deen is evidenced by the presence of Namat. Deen is given and perfected by God Almighty. Mazhab is man-made. Deen is evidenced by the presence of Namat in all its form. Mazhab is evidenced by the absence of Namat. So we do not see right now any any shield from uh, or any uh, safety from pain and suffering and lawlessness and destruction. We are in fact engulfed into that. We do not see any peace. Uh, in all aspects. We do not see any success or prosperity. Instead of being at the height of the world or at the, as a role model of the world, we are being attacked again in, in, in the name of Islamophobia. So this is not Namat. And more than that, Deen is evidenced by the unity. We are divided into so many sects and so many fiqh. This is not Deen. This is Mazhab of one form or the other. And the uh, uh, Solution. The reason of this is that this is a conversation that our prophet would have at the day of judgment when our prophet would complain that my my people have abandoned this Quran. And that's exactly what we have done as Muslim Ummah. And this is 
the the reason why we do not as muslims do not have any willingness or courage to do anything because god says that those who do not use aql the word use here is yaqilun those who do not use their reasoning and faculties of thinking and pondering god will embed doubt in them they would not have the willingness and the courage or the strength to do anything they they would have they would be full of doubts and here god is addressing our muslim leaders our ustad our imam our peshwa and god is addressing them and asking them that you order righteousness towards other people you call other people towards the right path but have you looked at yourself do you use your reasoning and thinking do you use your own aql or not and here it's a harsh reality that we follow everybody else we follow our scholars we follow our leaders we follow our parents our siblings we follow everyone but we do not follow one god almighty and this would be a conversation that would happen at the time of the day of judgment by the followers when the followers would complain to god that we followed somebody else and that somebody else had led us astray from the path of god and god would reply that now it's too late they will face what they did and you will face what you did there's a basic distinction between humans and animals as we all know animals are governed by the instinct to survive they are born with the knowledge and their whole life they eat they prey they hunt they colonize they migrate they survive they die in the end all surrounded by the instinct to survive their path is to survive we as humans are differentiated from animals on two broad parameters one is our free will our ability and our freedom to choose and decide and the second is all our senses our six senses our six faculties and our faculties of thinking and reasoning and god says here that those who do not use their faculties their faculties are of no use to them they have eyes but they cannot see they have ears but they cannot hear they have mouth but they cannot speak they have heart but they cannot understand because they are not using their faculties of thinking and reasoning they are like animals but then god goes on to say that no they are worse astray in their path because to survive is not the path of humans and here god is saying that the worse in the eyes of god are those who are deaf dumb and blind who do not use their aql and worse not only in terms of all the human beings worse in terms of all the creation of god almighty and god is saying that those who do not use their aql their reasoning they are worse in the eyes of god among all his creation a very very harsh ayat by god almighty and the solutions given by god is that whether you are alone or in pairs think ponder utilize all your faculties so much so that god says that do not even fall on my ayat deaf dumb and blind use all your faculties use thinking and pondering and here god is reminding us that quran is rahim for those who believe that if our iman is strong quran will become rahim for us it is a lifeline it's a source of survival even now if we do not adopt quran we will become extinct as true muslims quran is shield it's a protection be it islamophobia or colonization or any evil nothing can touch us even now if we adopt quran quran is a selfless love and sacrifice from our creator for us and quran is a source of miracle like growth and progress for us we can touch the golden height again we can take ourselves out of this utter and complete darkness and touch the golden height again because quran is rahim for us if we be- So the solution as per Quran is the rational approach to deen which works at three levels the first and the foremost focusing on the primary source of information for deen and the primary source of information for deen is Quran then lateral thinking lateral thinking is that you learn from your environment you utilize all your faculties and you utilize your faculties of thinking and reasoning vertical thinking is that you learn from your forefathers and whatever you learn you teach your next generation this is a followers mindset quran is against the followers mindset logical thinking is fast fact based thinking emotional thinking is feelings based thinking as muslim umma either we close our mind whenever it comes to matters of deen or we approach the matters of deen emotionally with feelings i'll give you an example 
my daughter comes from the university she is very upset she screams at me and then she goes upstairs to her room now i am feeling the feelings of anger and rage and being disrespected i can react on these feelings or i can go to her room i can make her sit down and i can ask her what has happened you have never disrespected me like this before tell me what has happened gather facts gather knowledge base your behavior your beliefs on knowledge not on feelings pursuit of knowledge is a holy activity as per deen e islam and why the time to act is now it's because the growing momentum of islamophobia and by its very terminology it unites us it is uniting us and we can defeat it only if and when we are able to unite under the one deen e islam and the other reason is the current pandemic it is a time of self reflection it's a time of self assessment self correction now is the time to think what do we need to do and what we need to do is to become a muslim and muslim by definition is somebody who is a follower of deen e islam not a follower of mazhab e islam who is a follower of deen e islam and the basic duty for us as muslim is to understand what deen is is to complete our knowledge of deen and then practically implement deen e islam in our lives this is our basic duty as deen and the first step is open the book and read and my recommendation to you would be that open quran with word by word translation and think and ponder and utilize all your faculties in thinking about these quranic ayahs do not rush spend time this is our basic duty as muslim and let me tell you out of experience if you do this the book the book quran would engulf you in itself you would feel as if god almighty your creator is talking to you directly guiding you giving you strength and courage and guiding you to the right path it's an amazing experience that i cannot explain in words So in conclusion I've picked out few verses from Ilama Iqbal's poetry a jawab e shikwa these uh, verses are in urdu and I'm going to give you a summary in the end in these verses god is talking to muslim umma and god is saying safa dahr se batil ko mitaya kisne nuh e insaan ko ghulami se chhudaya kisne mere kaabe ko jabino se basaya kisne mere quran ko seeno se lagaya kisne the to aaba wo tumhare hi magar tum kya ho haath pe haath dhare muntazir e farda ho farda means that you're waiting for somebody else's decision manfaat means advantages benefits manfaat ek hai is qaum ki nuksan bhi ek ek hi sab ka nabi din bhi imaan bhi ek har paak bhi allah bhi quran bhi ek kuch badi baat thi hote jo musalman bhi ek firqa bandi hai kahin aur kahin jaate hain kya zamane mein panapne ki yahi baatein hain shor hai ho gaye duniya se musalman aaboot hum ye kehte hain ki the bhi kahin muslim maujood waza mein tum ho nasara to tamaddun mein hanood ye musalma hai jinhe dekh ke sharmaye yahood yu to sayyid bhi ho mirza bhi ho afghan bhi ho tum sabhi kuch ho batao to musalman bhi ho har musalman rage batil ke liye nashtar tha uske aayna e hasti mein amal e jauhar tha jo bharosa tha use quwwat e bazu pe tha hai tumhe maut ka dar use khuda ka dar tha wo zamane mein mauzzaz the musalma hokar aur tum khwar hue tarik e quran hokar they were the leaders of the world they were the powerful the rich the rulers of the world they were the benchmark the role model for the world because they were muslims and we are doomed we are targeted and attacked by islamophobia 